Hey guys, I told you more hardware releases were going to follow soon, and today is the day, and sh we should have another one before the end of the year. But today I'm introducing you the AN Penta Plus, a five channel analog PWM dimmer with a few extras, such as having high power channels, uh, ethernet, and even a digital output option, making it the first hybrid controller for me. Let's quickly take a look. Now I do need to apologize a little bit. I'm still recovering from being sick. That's why there was no video or live stream last week, but I'm going to try and uh, power through this. So the AN Penta Plus is the next board in the AN Penta lineup. After a great reception of the AN Penta Mini, it's time to introduce one of its more capable siblings. The AN Penta Mini is great for situations where you just need a single RGB CCT or multiple smaller or rather low power white strips, but in situations where you need a lot more power, it's not the right board, and the AN Penta Plus certainly is. It has five times analog PWM outputs, just like the AN Penta Mini, but they are built differently. Where the AN Penta Mini has two times medium outputs that can do five amps, and three times low power outputs that can do three amps max, the AN Penta Plus has five times high power outputs, which can do 10 amps each, with an up to 30 amp total controller limit. At 24 volt, this is 720 watt of LED power, which should suffice in most situations, I think. I love pairing it with a Meanwell UHP 500-24, which is capable of delivering 20 amps in total silence. Especially if you want to deploy several high power white strips, this controller is uniquely suited since two of the output channels have double terminals with which you can do power injection. Next to that, the board has been tuned to be used with high PWM frequencies of around 20 kilohertz and still achieve those output numbers. This in combination with my custom circuit to do DC-DC conversion and output filtering makes sure the board is fully silent even while dimming. If you need even higher PWM frequencies, this is also possible but because of the MOSFETs switching losses, you might need to lower the maximum amps you can get out of the board per output. The board, like the AN Penta Mini, is also fully compatible with 12 to 48 volt LED strips, so you can use new 48 volt strips to be able to run them long lengths while having to worry less about voltage drop. Now let's take a look at the front of the controller first to explain all the ports that are on there, and it should also take us through most of the features it has. We're starting on the right, and there we see two times two pin pluggable 7.62 millimeter rising clamp terminals. To truly be able to achieve the power numbers stated, you first need to be able to feed the board with that much amperage. This is where I see it go wrong with a lot of other controllers on the market. They write high amp numbers on their controller, but then don't really allow you to connect a power supply to actually support that, which then kind of makes it a moot point if you ask me. Uh, this controller supports nice and thick cable up to 10 gauge if needed. Continuing to the left, we see a green pluggable connector. This is for a 3.81 millimeter pluggable connector that comes delivered with the board and allows you to connect up to three button inputs. Those are all hardware pulled high and debounced, so even if you want to run a switch a bit further away, that should still work perfectly. It also has a ground and 3.3 volt output terminal if you need to connect it to something like a rotary encoder. Moving further to the left, we have one of the unique features for this board in the AN Penta lineup, and that's a 10 100 Ethernet port. If you're not a fan of Wi-Fi or cannot use it in your setup or project, using this port, you can hardwire it into your network, no problem. This works great both in WLED or ESP Home. Moving even more to the left, we see a Stemma QT I2C port. 
This can be used to connect all kinds of sensors and other options, such as a screen, for instance. A great little expansion port which allows you to customize the controller to how you'd like to use it. Part of that philosophy we see even more to the left, and now we've reached the end, and that's the USB-C port. This controller is yours when you buy it, and you can run whatever software you'd like. No lockdowns or deliberately making it hard to run different firmwares. The USB-C port can be used to program the ESP32 inside, including ESD protection and an auto programming circuit. So it also fully supports software updates or whatever may come in the future. And then last, above that, we have an external Wi-Fi antenna connection. We all hate shoddy Wi-Fi reception, so using an external antenna is the best way to try and get the best connection. It comes with a decent Wi-Fi antenna included, um, you can see it right here, it uh, bends nicely. But if you'd like to shop for a more powerful one, get one with an RP-SMA connection and you can hook it right up to the board or to the controller. Moving on, let's take a quick look inside of the controller and there are five features I'd like to highlight. First is the completely custom DC-DC circuit design, making sure all voltages the board needs are generated and stably provided. Especially on PWM dimmers, this is important since the PWM can interfere and bleed through to power sources if you're not careful. Second, to help power even more, I have also implemented heavy decoupling to try and give your power supply an easy task of providing power to your LEDs. This also helps prevent some, if not all, of the noise your power supply can sometimes make using PWM dimmers, or at least, you know, I try to, or the circuit tries to. <laughs> Third, to make sure the board can deliver the power required for high power LED strip, the board uses modern MOSFETs with very low resistance, coupled with 10 volt gate drivers, making sure the MOSFETs perform optimally and provide a very granular fade, especially using ESP Home with high bit depth dimming. Fourth, there is a socket for an internal I2C temperature sensor that I'm using on most of my newer boards now. Sadly, these uh, I2C temperature sensor boards are not yet available. I hope to make them available next year. And well, as the fifth, maybe the most important one, I guess it's become kind of a trademark of my boards, but all positive outputs are individually fused with replaceable fuses, or user replaceable fuses, I should say. If you do make a wiring mistake or something else goes wrong while your controller is running 24 seven unattended, the fuses will try and protect your install without it causing a fire. I find that a very important feature, but yeah. All right, from the internals, let's move on to the back side of the board. And here I'd like to start at the left. I took great care and partly expense to get all terminals color coded specifically for their function. So starting from the left, you see two red pluggable 5.08 millimeter terminals. Those are connected to two internal fuses at max eight amp per output. Moving to the right, we have the first dimming channel, which also has two outputs for when you want to run very high power strip or longer lengths. You can use the same output channel to run power injection wires. This works very differently from digital LEDs where you can just add uh, VCC and ground. You actually have to take the ground from the controller and the same MOSFET for analog or PWM signals. Going to the right, we see a duplicate of what we just discussed with a second dimming channel, again, with power injection capabilities. Moving even more to the right, we have the other three channels that are available, even though these are just as capable, they're all capable of 10 amps each. The first two have the power injection option as there is only so much space for terminals on a board. So the last three don't get extra power injection terminals. You can try jamming in multiple wires, but uh, yeah, that's up to you. Regarding the positive terminals again, each output is run through its own 8 amp fuse, as I mentioned, but since they all share the same power supply, you can divide them as is needed for your setup. So although they are grouped with L1 and L2 outputs, you can also use those for L3, L3, 4, and 5 in whatever mix of strips or whatever you're building for your setup. I have articles on the website explaining how to divide it all best over the available outputs, so I advise you to check those out. Moving a little bit more to the right, we get to another unique feature of the board, 
and that is next to having analog PWM outputs, it also has a single digital LED output. But since digital LEDs often run different voltages versus analog, I've built in that orange terminal to deal with that. Orange terminal can be used to attach an external buck converter to the board, which will take in whatever voltage you are providing the AM Penta Plus and convert it to whatever your digital LEDs need and then I'll put that over the blue connector. This way you can run five volt digital LEDs while only having a single 24 volt power supply, for instance. If however you don't want or need to use a buck converter and the digital LEDs are also 24 volt, for instance, you can use the port labeled buck in and it will, it will deliver relay switchable output directly to the digital LEDs. This internal relay is there to make sure the digital LEDs don't use power when turned off. Analog LEDs inherently by their design don't use any idle power when off, so no need for dual power supplies with this controller. Okay, and I think that goes over most features of the board. It's been a long road getting these boards out of the design and production stage, but we're finally here and I'm very proud of the results. I think this is a unique offering, and if you're running Home Assistant or like, there isn't a better natively compatible PWM dimmer out there, I believe. The integration with Home Assistant using WLED or especially ESP Home is just perfect. Now, you might think analog or dumb PWM LEDs aren't needed anymore with digitally controllable LEDs, and well, you know, I make controllers for those, being available. But for several use cases, analog LEDs still reign supreme. Things such as main or task lighting, like here in my studio, for instance, where you need high volumes of light, color accurate white light, or running high PWM frequencies is still where analog LEDs shine. And actually here in my studio, I need all three of that. <laughs> As is normal by now, I have filled a specific section of quinled.info with all the information you might want to know about the board, and the boards are available to buy right now. I'm going to try and have stock at Dr. Z's soon after this video releases, and stock should be available at Allnet immediately. The official price for the board is $39.99, a bit higher than other more generic options out there, but packaging so much power and features into the board doesn't come cheap. So I hope it fits some of your projects. And as a note, yes, I know shipping from Allnet has become really expensive. We are looking into various options to get those rates down, but especially during this time of the year, it's hard. I hope you can understand that. I hope to have, that's a lot of hoping. I'm working on having better news about this in 2025. If you have questions, please leave a comment and I will try and get back to you. Or for help if your project join the Discord server. For now, whether you are going to pick up one of these boards or not, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you back in the future. Bye-bye.